Here's a little bit more about sequences and summations. I think I'll do a separate video with uh, some more examples um, of basic stuff, but I wanted to get into the idea of partial sums and summation notation, that kind of stuff, other stuff that's in section 11.1 .1 of our text. And so as usual, I'll start with a money example. Suppose that Uncle Frank can give me one dollar this year, then three dollars, then five dollars, then seven dollars every year thereafter, etc. And I'd like to, let's say, a sub n is the amount he gives me in year n. And the first thing I'd like to do is to get a formula for that. Well, it's all the odd numbers. But what's a formula for that? Well, in each, um, it's, gonna, it's a linear progression or an arithmetic sequence. I mentioned that in the last video. The way you can tell is it's got a constant difference. 3 minus 1, eh, math mode, 3 minus 1 is the same as 5 minus 3 is the same as 7 minus 5. If I look at each number minus the previous one, they're all equal to 2. And it's that constant difference that's a pretty crucial number. That's how much it goes up by each time. Well, remember that these are really just the sequence analogs of linear functions. Instead of y equals mx plus b, we're going to have a sub n equals the m is the slope. That's how much the output of the function goes up for each in one increase in input. Well, that's what we just calculated. And that's called the difference, d n. And then we just need to know the analog of the b. That's just going to be the starting number. All righty. Hmm. But what's that going to be? Is that going to be 1? Let's see. The trouble is that if I start out with n equals 1, if I start with n equals 1, it's a little tricky. And that's a pretty standard place to start. People often start with n equals 0, but if you start with n equals 1, that's a little different from the y equals mx plus b analogy, because that, the b is what you get when x equals 0. OK, so it's going to be just a little annoying, but we can figure it out. Because let's just put it in as just some question mark. a sub n equals, in this case, 2n plus, well, we'll just call it b for a second. OK. And let's just plug in what we know. We know that when n equals 1, you get $1. And that's going to be 2 times 1. I'm just plugging in n equals 1 plus b. Oh, OK. So b actually has to be minus 1 here. OK, and so this is a fairly standard way of creating all the odd numbers in sequence, 2n minus 1. Because 2n would produce the even numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8, all the multiples of 2, and I just subtract 1 to get 1, 3, 5, 7. That's another way we could have seen that. But this is a general, very general procedure. If you, you test to see if it's an arithmetic sequence by looking at the differences, if they're all the same, it is arithmetic. That gives you this constant difference, and a sub n is going to be d times something, and then you can solve for the for the, uh, the extra part, the constant term, by just plugging in any value. We'll get a master formula for this pretty soon, but that's, I don't think we need to go get to that quite yet. What I wanted to do was, in, as in addition to having this formula that tells us, OK, that's a way to organize all those odd numbers, that's the number, the amount he gives me in year n. But what I'm probably more interested in is the amount I have total after n years. What is that going to be? Well, let's assume we're not putting it in an interest-bearing account. We could certainly do that, but that's going to make it a little more complicated. Let's suppose we just take it and just save it um, and put it on their mattress or something like that. We're not going to earn, earn any interest or invest it or anything like that. And so the amount I have after one year is just one dollar, and then one plus three, and then one plus three plus five, and that's a process called partial sums. If I have a sequence, like this sequence a sub n, then 
S sub 1, use a capital, let me check, the book uses a capital S, I think, that's fine, yeah. That's just A sub 1. S sub 2 is A sub 1 plus A sub 2. S sub 3 is A sub 1, whoa, plus A sub 2 plus A sub 3, etc. S sub n, in general, is going to be A sub 1 plus A sub 2 plus all the way out to A sub n. Dot, dot, dots come into this stuff all the time because we're going to look at patterns and we don't want to have to write out all the numbers from 1 to n. And n is a variable, so we really couldn't write them out. We're not even sure how many there are. So that's the nth partial sum. The nth, whoops, partial sum, parial, partial sum of this sequence. And so there's a lot of cases, really, really important in mathematics, where you have some sequence of numbers, but you're mostly interested in how they sum up. And this is one simple example. That's to, it's going to be exactly equal to how much money I have after n years of being given this money. So as I said, the dot, dot, dots come up a lot, but they're a pretty vague kind of notation. It says, oh, I'm, you, you need to guess the pattern in here. Okay, so in this case, S sub n is going to be 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus, plus 7 plus dot 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 plus, and then we know a formula for the nth term, 2n minus 1. So that's one way to write it out, and it gives us a, it's a pretty good way to do things. You can get us an explicit idea of the first few terms to try to give us a hint, a very concrete hint, and then it names, it gives a formula for the nth term. But it's not that slick, and that dot, dot, dot can really cause confusion. So there's another notation, which is the sigma notation, or summation notation, which is I'm going to sum up, I'm going to have a master formula for the sum of all these guys, and I'm just going to put one formula in here, whoops, in, like in here, and that's going to give me all these numbers. But then I need uh, two other pieces of information. I need to know when to start, which number to start at, and which number to end at. And then I need another piece of information, which is probably the most subtle thing, it isn't as obvious, which is I need some sort of temporary variable that actually goes, that steps through all of these things as I'm doing the sum. The thing is, if you sum up 20 things, you need to actually be, keep track of where you are in the sum. If you added a, a table of numbers, and you added them up, and you got stuck in the middle, and you forgot, and you talked to somebody in the middle, and you forgot, oh, where was I? You're pretty much hosed in terms of summing that up. You're going to have to go back to the start. So we need a systematic device to put them together. So for example, S sub, uh, sub 8, let's say. What we're, what we're going to do is we're going to write it. We're going to have another variable, let's say k. It's purposely different from n. You'll see why in a minute. And this says the sum from k equals 1 to 8 of, and what I put in here is a formula that if you give me the k, which is going to run from 1 to 8, that that's going to replicate all these values. Well, that's just the a, but now a sub k instead of a sub n. So what this ta says is put in k equals 1 into this formula, write it down. That gives me 1. Then add to what happens if I took k equals 2 into this formula. That gives me 3. Then add 5, then add 7, then add. And stop when you get to 8. So 16 minus 1 is 15. Well, I guess I can do them all. And so that's a, a very uh, s uh, concise way, that's what the word I'm looking for, very concise way to symbolize this big sum as here's the pattern, the formula that generates them all. I have a temporary variable called a dummy variable that steps from 1 to 8 and gives me all these values when I put that into this formula. So in general here, S sub n, the nth sum, is going to be the sum k equals 1 to n of 2k minus 1. So notice this isn't, the n doesn't go in here. The n is an actual honest variable that has a meaning outside this summation. It tells me how many things that I actually sum up. How many years has Uncle Frank been giving me money? The k has a very different role. It is a completely temporary device just intended to package up this summation into one, um, one master formula that doesn't take as much writing. And so that's going to be 1 plus 3 plus dot 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 plus 2n minus 1. 
The reason that's an n and not a k is that that's what happens when k is at its last value n. And so the dot, dot, dots and the whole package have been replaced by the summation notation. Now, I picked this example uh, specifically because it's actually a really interesting one. Let's actually look at what these numbers are. In this case, that's 1. That's 1 plus 3 equals 4. That's 1 plus 3 plus 5 equals 9. Let me put in a new one. S4 equals 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 equals 16. Do you see a pattern in these numbers? 1, 4, 9, 16? Hmm. If you see a pattern, then maybe this is, let's test it. That's 25. Those are all the squares. That's really interesting. That when we sum up the consecutive odd numbers, we get the squares. So the conjecture would be, let's see, is this equal to, well, let's see what the pattern would be. The fourth sum gave me the fourth square. The fifth sum gave me the fifth square. The idea is maybe this is just exactly n squared. And that's something we're going to discover when we talk about not only arithmetic sequences as sequences, but the sums of arithmetic sequences. When we take the partial sums of these guys, what we're creating is what's called an arithmetic series, which is the sums, the sequence of sums of an arithmetic sequence. You might think that sequence and series should be just synonyms of each other. They sound very similar. Oh, that doesn't work very well. But series means you've taken some sequence, and then you actually look at the sums of your original sequence to create a new one. And that gets the special name of a series. OK, that's a good place to stop.